Can I highly recommend to you, particularly Platform Plus members, that you go to the opinion section of our webpage or the app uh, and get on board, get on board with the app and read an article entitled A Law School to be Avoided. And it is a piece uh, by Gary Judd, KC, um, long-serving lawyer in New Zealand. He's a, um, appeared several times before the Supreme Court uh, and before the Privy Council. And uh, Gary Judd writes this piece in response to a tweet from the dean, that's right, the dean of the law school at the Auckland University of Technology. Her name is Kylie Quince. Kylie Quince hasn't appeared before the Privy Council or the Supreme Court. Kylie Quince was a staff solicitor for three years before getting her job as Head of Law at Auckland University of Technology. And we will talk about Kylie Quince later, but right now we are joined on the line by Gary Judd, KC. Uh, Gary, thank you very much indeed um, for joining us again on the platform. Nice to talk to you again. Good morning, Sean. All right. Gary, we have already covered the story here about the, well, I thought quite remarkable and, and unusual requirements from next year for all people undertaking a course of study in law with the aim of being a lawyer in New Zealand. They now have to come uh, take part in compulsory training or papers regarding what is called tikanga Māori, which is kind of Māori cultural practices and I would say superstitions, the mysticism, the magic of Māori. Um, we were surprised at those requirements. Were you also surprised at those requirements? Yes, I certainly was. And it goes a bit further than simply a compulsory course, which all first-year law students will be required to undergo, but also the regulations essentially provide that tikanga Māori is to be infused into all law subjects. So whether it be crime or contracts or tort law, you've got tikanga has, will have to be infused into those subjects. Okay, what is tikanga precisely? Do you know? Um, well, my knowledge of tikanga is gained primarily from the statement of tikanga which the Supreme Court attached to its judgment uh, in the Peter Ellis continuance nice. case. Yeah. That is, when they gave leave for Peter Ellis Peter Ellis's estate to continue the appeal to the Supreme Court against his conviction, they invited the Crown and Ellis's lawyers to provide them with submissions on the relevance of tikanga to the Ellis case. Of quite surprising, really, because Ellis is not Māori. So far as is known, his complainants are not Māori, were not Māori. Uh, the case had absolutely no connection at all with Māori, and yet the Supreme Court gave this invitation. And the Crown lawyers and Peter Ellis's lawyers and some people who came in from the Māori Law Society and people like that all got together and they provided, by way of, of a so-called agreed statement of fact, uh, a statement of tikanga uh, authored by a couple of uh, uh, Māori um, professors who told us of what a what it, what it was and how it was supposed to be relevant to the Alice case. Now, <clears throat> they start under a, a head a section in that document headed the nature of tikanga. They say that tikanga is something which grew out of the land and came to New Zealand with uh, when Māori first came here and in some traditions the, state, the, the statement says uh, it was already here. Uh, so in other words it's, it's a mystical um, uh, type of um, uh, uh, belief system and uh, my uh, issue with that is that it's really no part um, of the, the, the law for mystical belief systems to be uh, incorporated in it. If, might, if it not Māori... be, uh, might it not be, Gary, in New Zealand, good to have lawyers who have a background in that particular or have some awareness of that particular culture? Are you saying it's 
completely irrelevant to the way our legal system works? Uh, well, no, I wouldn't say it's completely irrelevant because in some areas, for example, uh, in relation to determining Maori customary title to land, um, aspects of tikanga may, be, um, may need to be considered. And one can imagine that in certain areas, um, such as where um, a Maori is being sentenced, if he he or she is able to demonstrate that there's something in Ikanga Māori which is relevant to the way in which he offended. That's, you know, it may be that there's, there's some relevance for Tikanga there. But the, and, and there's no reason why law schools should not, uh, if they want to, uh, provide elective courses um, relating to tikanga so that any lawyer or prospective lawyer um, who wants to um, know more about this area can then take the course but my objection to what's happening is that the council for legal education by passing a regulation is compelling all law students throughout the country, all first-year law students starting from 1 January next year, to um, to take the subject uh, on Tikanga Māori and then to uh, put up with uh, Tikanga Māori being infused into all the, um, the the proper law subjects. So you have lodged an official complaint with whom about this, Gary? The Regulation Review Committee of the House of Representatives now, when I started looking into this, um, I found that the regulations made by the Council for Legal Education um, are what are called secondary legislation. In other words, they, they, these are not regulations made by Parliament, but they are made because Parliament has given a body outside Parliament power to, uh, to make... Um, uh, what's secondary law? Uh, because this is uh, this is law. These are regulations yeah. compelling uh, by law um, that these subjects be taught and so forth. Right. So, Gary, you have applied for this investigation. Are you going to get one? Is there going to be, if you like, a hearing and inquiry into this? I don't know um, what the regulation review committee will do with my. It's not a it's not a request for an inquiry. It's a complaint, yeah. and the the because it's secondary legislation, the Council for Legal Education was required to put the legislation before, uh, or sorry, the minister who in this case seems to be the Minister of Justice uh, is required to put the legislation before Parliament. Of course, the minister can't do that less been sent to him by the council and so far as I can tell it hasn't been so it's never been put before parliament. Now the reason that it's to be put before parliament is because parliament having given power to an organisation outside parliament to make laws um, is entitled to have a look at what its delegate as it were is doing and are they doing the right thing and there is also provision in the uh, in the legislation uh, relating to such matters for a member of the House to move a resolution of the House to disallow the secondary uh, re um, legislation. Now, the standing orders of the House say that uh, a resolution to that effect must be uh, moved by a member of the Regulation Review Committee. So my complaint to the Regulation Review Committee is that this legislation, uh, secondary legislation, um, whilst it might be uh, literally within the powers of the Council for Education, legal education is, is, uh, is secondary legislation which should not be made. And I've asked that the committee or a member of the committee uh, a move a motion in the House to have it disallowed. And so there's some urgency about this because from last year, the Council for Legal Edu Education has been telling prospective law students that as from 1 January 2025, um, these things are going to be compulsory. OK, so who so is the parliamentarian who, who, who this, the onus for action on this falls on, Gary? Uh, 